Welcome everybody. Today we will talk about registration and stitching of large terabyte data set. We will have with us uh, David Earl, Stephen Prybish, Sebastian Tosi, and John Bogovich. And so to help as panelists, uh, we will have uh, Julian Colombelli from IRB Barcelona, uh, myself, Ofra from Weizmann Institute, Anna from Uppsala University, and David Berry from Creek Institute. And if the first speaker, David Earl, is ready, I will ask him to share the screen. Thank you. Okay. Good. Uh, then thank you for the kind of introduction, uh, Rocco. Uh, yeah, my name is David Hurl. I work at the uh, University in, of Munich, LMU, and uh, together with Stefan Breibisch, who's also among the panelists, uh, group leader at Genelia Research Campus and MDC Berlin. Uh, we're going to give a little introduction to what we, uh, the general concepts behind big data stitching and uh, big data registration, and then focus on the software that we wrote together to address the various problems that arise uh, with these tasks, which is Big Stitcher. But I want to spend the first few minutes uh, kind of introducing the basics. And in various disciplines of biology, uh, for example, developmental biology or neurobiology, uh, scientists uh, need solutions to image very large samples, such as tissues or entire organs or organisms with very high resolution. And over the last few decades, several hardware solutions uh, for these problems have been developed. So the gold standard for a very long time has been confocal microscopy, uh, which provides really good optical sectioning so you can acquire three-dimensional image stacks of large samples. And uh, confocal microscopy has a pretty high resolution uh, and it is somewhat quick so you can also image uh, live samples. Now from this kind of uh, middle point, you can go in various directions. If you want the best resolution possible, you might want to go to something like electron microscopy where you can uh, take a sample like the C elegans here, slice it into ultra thin sections, and then acquire hundreds and hundreds of images on an electron microscope, and then combine them into a three-dimensional volume image of the whole worm at nanometer resolution. Or if you want to go into a different, in the other direction, uh, in the last 15 years or so, light sheet microscopy has risen to prominence. And light sheet uh, differs from conventional light microscopy in that you don't use the same objective to look at, that you use to look at your sample to illuminate it, but rather you have a secondary objective that shines a single plane of light into your sample. And this uh, gives you very good optical sectioning, like in confocal microscopy, but you can also image very quickly and with very low light doses. And this allows uh, developmental biologists, for example, to uh, image the development of, uh, I think this is some crustacean lava over days uh, and still have very high resolution. Uh, I noticed that my video is a bit choppy. So if it's choppy for you as well, I apologize. Um, but you can't only use uh, light sheet microscopy to image living samples. You can also image it, use it to image very large fixed samples by combining it with some clever sample preparation techniques uh, like sample clearing, which are chemical tricks uh, with which you try to make your sample transparent by uh, equalizing the refractive index within the sample to its environment. And that way it becomes transparent and you can see through it and also image deep within it. And likewise, a couple of years ago, the technique of expansion microscopy was developed 
where you take a tiny sample embedded in a hybrid gel and then physically enlarge it so that you can actually image it at super resolution on a conventional microscope. And again, the samples that you create in that way can readily be imaged uh, with light sheet microscopy. And all these examples that I mentioned now have one thing in common. Uh, they consist not only of a single image, but of many, many images. And for us to perform any kind of downstream analysis uh, on them, we first need to take all of the images and essentially map them all to a common coordinate system. And this is actually the task that we want to solve with image registration or image alignment or stitching. And this is then no longer a hardware task, but typically a software task. And uh, there exist many solutions uh, for image alignment, but in principle, they all follow a pretty common pipeline and workflow. And it usually works uh, like this. So you start off by looking at all of your images in pairs. So you pick two images and then find out how those two images are transformed relative to each other. And if you do this for all overlapping images in your data set, you end up with a network of pairwise transformations. And then you usually perform a step of global optimization to reach a consensus if there are some ambiguities in the system. And you might be done at this point, but you can also repeat this process several times. So for example, to refine your alignment with more and more complex uh, registration models. Uh, so you might uh, start off with just a translation of the images and then do a refinement step in which you also allow uh, rotation or scaling or even fully non-rigid transformations. And once you're happy with the uh, transformations that you've calculated, uh, the last task uh, is typically to uh, fuse the image, which is either to combine it into one volume or and save it to disk, but also just displaying uh, the data set can be a challenge. And okay, for the first part, uh, finding out how two images uh, are shifted relative to each other, there exists a variety of strategies. And I just want to uh, mention the main ideas behind them. So there are two ways of finding out uh, how images are transformed relative to each other. And uh, one of them is intensity-based, where you kind of look at the overlapping part of the images and then measure how similar the intensities of all the pixels in there are. And there are a variety of ways to do that efficiently, either by working in Fourier space or doing it iteratively with an optimization scheme or using a multi-resolution representation of the data. Uh, but you can also do it image alignment in another way, which is uh, you detect interest points, key points in both images, and then just match those points to each other and uh, map the coordinates of those points so that they lie on top of each other. And uh, again, there exists a variety of ways to do that. Uh, some of them are automatic, where you automatically detect interest points, for example, bright or dark spots in the image, then construct a descriptor with, with which you can find them again in the other image. And examples for this are like SIFT or ORB for 2D images, or also the three-dimensional geometric local descriptor that we use in our multi-view reconstruction for 3D images. But you can also pick key points manually and then simply map those points to each other. And I think John will uh, mention that with Big Warp, where you can do manual uh, alignment of big data. Okay, uh, so these are the basic principles on how to align images, but especially with the data that we are facing, uh, there are several challenges. And one obvious challenge is the data size. So uh, I just want to mention two data sets that we acquired in 
during our work on Big Stitcher. Uh, the first one is a cleared mouse embryo. And uh, basically every colored square in this image corresponds to a volume of 2000 by 2000 by 1000 pixels. And altogether it was around three terabytes big. Or this example down here, where we have a Drosophila larval central nervous system that was expanded and then imaged on a light sheet microscope from various angles. Uh, and it totals to around 700 gigabytes. And this is more than you can, for example, fit into the RAM of even a powerful workstation. So you have to come up with strategies where you can do the work uh, piece by piece, for example. And there are other challenges because uh, you might have different kinds of aberrations that you want to correct. Uh, so the simplest case is, uh, for example, if you just want to stitch a few tiles, the metadata you get from your microscope stage might not be accurate enough to just simply paste them on top of each other. And you have to correct for that. But you might also have uh, more complex phenomena such as uh, chromatic aberrations, uh, spherical aberrations that can't just be corrected with uh, a shift, but where you have to use affine transformations or even more complicated ones. In light sheet microscopy, you can also uh, often have the possibility to rotate your sample and then look at it from another angle. And then again, it is an image alignment problem to register those multiple views of the data set. And finally, in large data sets, you might even have uh, you might even have aberrations that uh, depend on the sample itself. For example, if you uh, illuminate from different uh, sides or if you rotate the sample, uh, some deformations might actually depend on the refractive index at some point in the sample. So you have to uh, do a non-rigid registration where you move one bit of the image different than another bit. And furthermore, we want the tools that we use to register our images uh, to be as robust as possible. So it's a time consuming process and uh, we don't want it to fail because of one little error that happens along the way. And you can do that either by making the algorithms themselves error tolerant or by giving the user the ability to check the progress uh, during uh, the work and manually intervene if something goes wrong. And to meet all of these challenges, uh, Stefan and I and colleagues uh, wrote Big Stitcher. And Big Stitcher is uh, an image uh, Fiji plugin uh, that uh, for reconstructing and registering image data sets with a specific focus on cleared and expanded light sheet data but it is also a general purpose uh, image registration tool. And the first task that Big Stitcher tries to solve, uh, I didn't even mention it before, but uh, your data set typically consists of many images. They might be in many files, they might be in a variety of formats. Uh, so actually just assembling all of the images into one uh, data set that you can work with can be a challenge on its own. And so with Big Stitcher, we wrote a, a kind of automatic loader that would use bioformats, not only to read the uh, image data, but also try to parse metadata and place the images uh, according to metadata if possible. And we also added the possibility to easily uh, move images to a regular grid, for example, if you don't have metadata available. And also, uh, it's many of the subsequent steps can be done on downsampled versions of the images. So we offer the possibility to resave the data in a multi-resolution pyramid where you don't save, just save the full resolution image, but also downsampled versions of it in a format like HDF5 or N5. And that way you can do lots of the work uh, later on on a smaller version, which uh, 
reduces compute, compute time uh, by a lot. Okay, but then uh, once we are able to load our image data, uh, the first task is to find out how pairs of images are transformed relative to each other. And in the simplest case, where we only uh, look at translations, uh, we use a method called phase correlation, where you take two images, then do a few manipulations of their Fourier transforms. And then in the end, you end up with a so-called phase correlation map, uh, an image that is essentially black, except for one point. And this, the location of this point corresponds exactly to the shift between these two images. And we also realized that you could uh, detect this point with subpixel accuracy, uh, which is really useful because, again, we don't have to use the full resolution image, but rather we can use a strongly downsampled version, for example, eightfold downsampled version, and still get a very low error in our registration. While at the same time, if we downsample eightfold in three dimensions, we reduce the data size by 500 fold and also reduce the compute time. Uh, and what I also mentioned is uh, it's useful if the user can see the results of their uh, calculations right away. So uh, in Big Stitcher, we make extensive use of Big Data Viewer, which was uh, presented last week, I think. Uh, for example, to preview the shifts of one image to all its neighbors. So you can click through them. And if you see an error, you can also manually say, uh, ignore this link. And once we have done that, uh, we have a quite involved procedure of finding a global consensus, a global optimum of all of the shifts that we uh, calculated. And our procedure is actually able to uh, remove uh, links that disagree too much with their neighbors automatically. And we also have uh, methods in place where you can uh, register patches of images that are that only have a background between them and still place them correctly according to some pre-registration that you have, like metadata. And by combining all of this, you can take a data set like this. It's a mouse brain slice. Uh, and it would come out of the microscope uh, with some obvious uh, inaccuracies in the registration. But in using Big Stitcher, you can easily align all of the tiles into one seamless volume. But this might sometimes not be enough. So uh, you might have classical optical aberrations like spherical aber uh, chromatic aberrations where two wavelengths uh, have a slightly different uh, transformation. Uh, so you might want to refine on your initial stitching result. And in Big Stitcher, we do this uh, by a method called iterative closest points. So we would detect points uh, automatically in all channels. Uh, and if you have a tissue with some uh, amount of autofluorescence, those bright and dark points actually are the same in both color channels. And what you can then do is uh, you can move the points on top of each other in both channels, uh, allowing for rotations and scalings, and therefore have the channels snap into place uh, even nicer than with just the translation. And this is uh, what it would look like on this data set. And similarly, you might have things like spherical aberrations where the right side of one image and the left side of the neighboring image are not transformed in the same way. And again, using uh, this method, uh, you can correct for such phenomena as well. And if we go one step further, uh, you might even have complicated transformations uh, due to 
changes in the refractive index of the sample, even though you cleared it, it will not be 100% equal to the environment. Uh, and those errors might still be there, even if you do affine registration. So in Big Stitcher, we actually have two ways of further refining uh, the registration. One possibility is you can virtually split up your images into smaller images and then just uh, align those images. Or we also uh, allow for fully non-rigid uh, registration using piecewise affine uh, transformation. So basically every point in the image uh, gets its own transformation and its own uh, deformation. And with these tools, uh, you can even correct for the errors that remain uh, after all the previous steps. And I want to mention at this point, uh, Big Stitcher shares its DNA with Stefan's multi-view reconstruction software uh, that you can use to align multiple views in a light sheet microscope where you can rotate the sample. But now with everything that Big Stitcher can do, you can image your sample from one side, acquire lots and lots of tiles, then rotate it, acquire lots and lots of tiles from that side as well, and align everything using one software package uh, in Big Stitcher. And for example, here in this uh, mouse brain, you can see uh, we can do the stitching, but then also rotate it 180 degrees, essentially doubling the volume that we can image. And uh, with more and more uh, complex transformations that we support, uh, we could actually on a test data set uh, show that we also, this truly uh, improves the quality um, of the alignment, especially uh, if you have a multi-view or a dual illumination data set. And I think it's also nice to mention how long this process takes. So this test data set was around uh, 170 gigabytes in size. And actually calculating all of the shifts between the images and the transformations uh, takes uh, a few minutes of time. So uh, it's quite manageable on a standard workstation. And the only really time consuming step is actually uh, saving the results to, to disk in the end, which can take several hours. Uh, but in many cases, we might not even have to do that because we have Big Data Viewer and Big Data Viewer can display the uh, transform images in real time. So if you just want to look at your data sets, do some visual analysis of it, uh, you can do that without even having to save the results to disk. And as you can see here, you can seamlessly uh, zoom through your sample, even look at it from the side. And this typically happens in real time using Big Data Viewer. Uh, exactly, and more and more, uh, there are tools available to actually perform uh, downstream analysis uh, using the Big Data Viewer framework. And I think next week, uh, Jean-Yves Tienewe will present uh, Mammut and Mastodon. Uh, that are tools to actually perform tracking, tracking, visualization, and annotation in Big Data Viewer. So those could be seamlessly integrated uh, with uh, the data sets that we reconstruct earlier. But if you want to save your results to disk, uh, we also have a few optimizations in Big Stitcher for that. So we, on the one hand, we offer a, an optimal brightness adjustment uh, to account for things like bleaching in subsequent tiles and so forth. Uh, and we also can do deconvolution, like the multi-view reconstruction. Uh, but in Big Stitcher, we can actually we do it virtually. So, which means that even in a terabyte-sized data set by uh, K 
calculating a deconvolution on the fly, you can do this on a data set that would never fit into the main memory of your computer. And I want to end the presentation part with a few results. So this is the brain slides that I showed you earlier. And I just want to stop here um, and draw your attention to this part, this zoom uh, cutout. Uh, so it's a histone stain, and you can actually see the heterochromatin accumulations in those mouse nuclei. So you have subnuclear resolution in a centimeter sized data set. And uh, once again, you can image entire mouse brains and align uh, the tiles using Big Stitcher and then have cellular resolution again in this huge data set. And finally, I uh, want to show this uh, Drosophila central nervous system again, which we was expanded eightfold and then imaged on a multi-view light sheet microscope from four different angles in a tiled fashion. And with Big Stitcher, we could align the tiles from each angle and then all the angles to each other. And I think uh, it's a quite impressive results. Okay, so with this, I'm at the end of the presentation. If there are any pressing questions, uh, I guess we could answer them now. Otherwise, I would give a short demo of Big Stitcher. I'm working on answering them, David. I think they can also be all be answered in the question and answer session. Okay, then I'll continue with a small demo. Okay, and uh, actually the data set that I'll be working on is this confocal data set. Uh, consists of uh, six tiles, again, of a Drosophila CNS. Uh, it's available on the Big Stitcher uh, ImageJ Wiki page. If you want to play around with it yourself, you can scroll down to example data sets. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, Big Stitcher is a part of Fiji. So I'm just going to fire up my Fiji. And if you have not installed it already, you can easily uh, activate the update site of Big Stitcher by going to help update. Takes a couple of seconds uh, to check whether updates are, are available. But in this window, uh, you have the ability to manage update sites. And in this list, you can just tick Big Stitcher. Um, I already did it, but uh, then you would click Apply Changes. And the next time you start uh, your Fiji, Big Stitcher will be available. Now, uh, to start Big Stitcher itself, you can go to Plugins. Big Stitcher and Big Stitcher again. And then you're presented with, uh, with this window where it asks you for your data set file. So I mentioned earlier, a data set can consist of many image files. And uh, we save kind of all the metadata and the registrations that we calculate in an XML file. So either you already have that, or you can just define a new data set. Uh, and I'm going to do this using our automatic loader that takes care of a lot of the uh, organizational things for you. And this is actually what our data set looks like. Uh, so it's TIFF stacks, uh, and they're called something C something uh, hyphen seven something. So the C stands for the color channel, and the other number is uh, the index of the tile. And the first step is to select which files we want to include in our data set. And the easiest way, I think, if you have all of them in one folder, you can just drag your folder here. 
and it will include all of the files in the data sets. You could alternatively uh, just drag a single file in there and uh, place wildcards in this file path. So we have C something that you indicate with a star and then seven something. And that way you can also build up your data set. If we then click OK, it will take a few moments because now Big Stitcher looks at all the files that you include and it tries to parse some metadata on what the different files represent, if there are colors, if there are different angles, and so forth. Uh, in this case, because it's plain TIFF stacks, we can't find out much, but we saw that there are numerical patterns in the file name. So Big Stitcher will say, your files are C something seven something dot TIFF. And it will ask us, what does this first thing represent? We can say, those are our channels. And the section pattern represents our tiles. Now, uh, Big Stitcher also tries to parse uh, the pixel size. Uh, in this case, it says one by one by one pixels. So that's not super helpful. But you can manually set it. And in this data set, uh, the pixel size is actually 0 0.45 by 0 0.45 by 2 microns. And finally, uh, since we don't have metadata, uh, we also offer to move the images to a grid automatic, uh, interactively. Uh, that makes sense. And we'll see what that looks like in a moment. Now, the next question uh, that we have to ask is, how do we want to load the image data? Uh, we can just load the raw data as it is. But we can also try to load it virtually with caching, which is very useful if you just want to have a quick look at a very large data set that doesn't fit into memory all at once. Or you can immediately resave it in a multi-resolution format, so HDF5 or N5. Uh, and we generally recommend that you do that because it makes everything else faster. So it makes the processing faster, and it makes it easier to display the data in Big Data Viewer in real time. So I just do that. Uh, you could manually set uh, options on how big, uh, how this multi-resolution pyramid is calculated, but typically the defaults here are very sensible choices. And now we will load the data set and then immediately resave a multi-resolution version. It takes a couple of seconds here for this uh, around 150 megabytes. OK, and once we're finished, a, the first thing that we see is uh, a big data viewer window pops up. Just make that a little bit bigger and move our data sets into the middle. Um, I think if you, I think big data viewer was uh, discussed in this lecture series last week. So I would assume in the recording, uh, there is a, there will be a recording where Big Data Viewer and the navigation in Big Data Viewer is explained in detail. So I won't try to go too much into detail, but essentially on a Mac, you can zoom by pressing command and then scrolling, or you can double press to move the image around. So this is our data set. And since we uh, earlier said we wanted to move it to a regular grid, uh, these regular grid options pop up. And it's a bit boring because the default settings actually work nicely for this data set because it was acquired in this zigzag pattern. But we could also, if you don't know how your data set is, what's right, you can simply click through all the possibilities here and you will see a preview in real time until you then find 
how your images are arranged. You can also uh, play with the overlap in real time. And kind of to get a pre-registration of the data sets. And then when you click apply transformations, uh, you actually now end up with the main window of Big Stitcher. And uh, in here, it's basically a list of all the images in your data set. Uh, so you can look at them individually or you can select multiple. And by default, we group the colored channels, but you can also unclick this and only look at the red channel if you want. And a pretty useful uh, little thing that we included is if you click into this window and then press the C button, it will actually color the different uh, tiles in your data set differently. So you immediately see uh, if there are any errors in the alignment of the, of the tiles. And then once you have your data set ready, uh, we can actually proceed with stitching the data set. In Big Stitcher, uh, the way you do most operations is you select the images that you're interested in, and then you right click, oops, and then you right click, and then you have a list of things that you can do with those images. And in our case, we wanna stitch the data sets. Uh, and we prepared a kind of wizard to do that, so which will guide you through the process. If you just click that, uh, it will ask us, we have multiple channels in this data set. How do you, how should it treat them? It could use just one channel for the registration, or it could average all of them. Um, so in our case, let's just average them. And it will also ask us uh, what downsampling uh, of the data we want to use for the stitching. And as I mentioned earlier, it typically works nicely with uh, downsampled images. Uh, in this case, with a pre-computed two by two downsampling in the HDF5 file. So let's just use that because then we can just simply load that and uh, don't have to do any uh, redundant calculations. Okay, uh, you didn't see it in the progress bar here, but it took a couple of seconds to calculate all of the pairwise shifts now. Uh, and then we have the ability to go into preview mode. So if we click that, uh, what we can do now is we can select uh, a single image So we can go through the images and just see how are their neighbors transformed relative to each other. And in this window here, we can click through all of the uh, pairwise shifts and kind of manually check whether it worked all right. Here it did actually, uh, but if something, for example, here we have very low overlap. So sometimes it happens that we can't automatically get a shift here. So we, uh, or we get a wrong shift. So we could actually right click here and choose to ignore this link, for example. And we can also filter links based on the correlation of these overlapping intensities or something, if the shift is too big or too small, we can also ignore it here in this uh, filter panel. After that, uh, I'm gonna click apply and run the global optimization. So we have various strategies for the global optimizations, but to be honest, I would just stick with the default here that comes with all of the optimizations, like the iterative removal of uh, disagreeing links and so forth, because it typically doesn't increase the uh, processing time much. So I'll just let that run through and in kind of one instant, uh, our tiles snap neatly into place. And now it already looks uh, pretty nice. 
this aligned data set. Uh, but we could even uh, try to refine this alignment with a, a, a theme transformation. And again, we select our images, go to refine with iterative close, closest points. Um, and in this panel, so we can basically, what it will do, it will detect interest points and then try to map them to each other. And here you can select some presets. So you might want to do it. You can set what kind of downsampling you want to use for the detection, what threshold for the points uh, detection. I'm going to leave it at the default now, but I will warn you, it will not work with the default settings. Uh, and I'm going to do tile registration because in this case, we don't have any autofluorescence or fiducial markers that are the same in every channel. So I'm going to try the tile registration now. So it will take a couple of seconds to detect all of the points, and then it tries to map them on top of each other. And actually, in this case, uh, you can see it, uh, it actually fails. It kind of bends one of the images to the side. Uh, and the reason is uh, the data set is quite small. So, and we downsampled it eightfold now. So it was simply so small that we could not detect anything reliable anymore. But this is, uh, I think, a good example of where the interactivity of Big Stitcher comes into play. Because you immediately see that something goes wrong. And then you can just right click and go down here to remove a transformation and simply remove the latest transformation. And then you're back at where you were after the stitching. And now let's try the refinement again. This time I'm actually using only four by four downsampling. So you activate that by hovering over it for a second. And now let's try it again. So again, it detects interest points and then maps them to each other. And you don't see a strong effect in this small data set, but uh, I mean, I at least have the feeling that if you look at the red and green here, for example, it snaps into place even more neatly. And you could, for example, go back into the main window and press C again, and then you're switching back to a standard uh, color visualization. You could go through your data set. But now you could also uh, simply fuse it and do some downstream processing. Um, so down here, you have possibilities of image fusion. You can quickly display everything that you have selected. Um, I'm going to do this with some downsampling. And you can see it immediately pops up as a standard image J image that you could then start to do uh, analysis on. And it's actually, it works this fast because you might see a little lag if you try to scroll through it because everything is computed uh, on the fly. So now we only compute this plane. And then kind of if we if I press uh, the arrow keys to go through plane by plane, uh, you <clears throat> it's calculated uh, as you need it, essentially. OK. But uh, in this uh, kind of more advanced image fusion dialog, you can also uh, set it to pre-compute the image if you want to save it right away or and so forth. Uh, you can choose which uh, pixel type, whether you want it in 32-bit or 16-bit. Uh, you can display the images in image J or immediately save them to disk. So we have all of that in there. And I would say with this, uh, this is the end of the little demo. I think I'm already a little bit over time. So uh, if there are any pressing questions, I can try to answer them. Otherwise, I would 
pass the button on to okay Simone. okay thank you david so uh, we had several questions and actually stefan was really good and the other panelists to answer in the question and answer um section um i just want to comment from you about the uh, file format you say data can be converted to hdf5 or n5 and you suggest mm -hmm. to increase the speed of a calculation right Yes. Okay. Um, so it's something that you suggest to do to every user at the beginning while they are starting to import their data in uh, Big Stitcher, or is something that you suggest to do just after? I mean, it's uh, if you really want to uh, work on the data, on the data set, set. Uh, I would always uh, save it uh, to to one of those two formats. Uh, I also mentioned you can, so, okay, let me rephrase it. If you really wanted to work, I would try to resave it. Actually, you can do it after the fact. So you can start uh, kind of by loading the raw data or virtually loading. And then again, in this main menu, you can right click and resave the data set as HDF5 or N5 after the fact. Um, if you just wanted to look at the images, then it's maybe faster if you uh, do it with virtual loading. So that way you would basically only, uh, for example, in Big Data Viewer, we are only looking at one uh, slice through the data set. And with virtual loading, it would only look, load the one plane that you're looking at. Uh, so that way you can see the data really quickly. Uh, but once you do something like rotate the, the image to its side, then it all of a sudden has to load all of the planes. Uh, and this is something that works much quicker with an HDF5 or N5 file because those formats also uh, save the data in blocks. So in this case, uh, we have a Y set cut. It would only need to load the blocks at this specific set uh, X location that we are. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you again for the nice presentation and also the lab demo and uh, big applause for you. And um, I would switch to the next speaker, uh, Sebastian, that will present a Mosaic Explorer J plugin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So yeah, I will first uh, share my screen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm uh, Sebastian Tosi, and I work at the Advanced Digital Microscopy Facility of IRB Barcelona. So maybe some of you remember me as the old generation of uh, new BS teachers, uh, but it's actually my first uh, time participating to this uh, very nice uh, uh, series of um, new BS Academy webinars. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And uh, yeah, my talk is on Mosaic Explorer J. Uh, it's actually not a plugin, it's a, uh, an image macro <laughs> to, uh, to stitch uh, uh, 3D microscopy tiled uh, data set, especially uh, uh, light sheet uh, microscopy data set. So uh, in a way, the application scope is uh, overlap or similar to a big teacher, but as a disclaimer, and I won't conceal it for very long, I guess you will quickly understand it. Our approach is really simpler. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, software engineering, I mean, the, it's order of magnitude simpler. Um, but it can uh, actually uh, work well if it fits your own application. So it's uh, somewhat easier to, uh, to use. And I will try to uh, highlight the uh, advantages of, the, of this approach. No? Um, so it's not as flexible as the big teacher. Uh, it's meant for some specific uh, uh, application. Okay. And it cannot also correct for all the uh, fine uh, errors and adjustments such as uh, chromatic aberration, et cetera, that uh, uh, David went through. Um, so 
the scope of the application is that your uh, tiles, uh, your microscopy tiles should be organized on a regular 2D grid. So it's not that you can place them anywhere. They should really be like regularly spaced. And also the format, at least uh, currently supported, it should be only uh, TIFF tiles, okay? So the tiles can be either 3D multi-TIFF files or TIFF series, so subfolders with uh, 2D TIFF files inside. And we also use a simple uh, scheme of XY indexes. So we need two numerical fields to, uh, to locate the, the tiles in the grid. Uh, so the big advantages of the, uh, of the tool is that it's simple to use and also probably quite simple to customize since it's an image macro. So if you need to add something that is not in there, you, you, you might be able to do it easily. Um, there is no uh, file conversion or duplication step, so it can work natively uh, with the 3 dt files. It's actually designed uh, to, to work this way. Uh, one big advantage is that you can use the tool while you are acquiring the, the images. Uh, so for instance, to spot that something is going really wrong during your acquisition. If an image is not present, so a, a given uh, this slice, it will just be black, so you won't see it, but software won't crash. Actually, the alignment is computational less. There is no uh, uh, computation or, or optimi automatic optimization steps of the tiles. It's based on uh, interactive uh, alignment. So the, the, it's user-based, as I will uh, demo uh, later. Uh, and what we use uh, to um, make this possible is a constraint uh, uh, transformation for the alignment. Uh, that I will also briefly describe in the slides. Uh, so it's somewhat simple. It cannot correct for any kind of errors as I will show, uh, but in our arms at least, and, and especially with the, the microscope we use, uh, uh, it's a custom light sheet microscope. It works quite well. It supports uh, dual-sided detection and uh, dual-sided illumination, and also some uh, illumination correction mode. Uh, for instance, to balance the intensity between the two sides and also some uh, flat field uh, correction based on reference images or, or adjustable uh, shading models. Uh, so stitching microscopy images, I will go very fast on this. David already did a good job, but basically it's when your sample doesn't fit in a field of view and you still want to image it with the, the current uh, acquisition setting you use. So essentially you, you tile. Uh, several field of view to, to see uh, an extended uh, region. No? Uh, typical way to do it is to use a regular grid to tile the sample and to provide some overlap between the tiles to avoid gaps, uh, missing information, and also to simplify the, the reconstruction of the images. Uh, practical challenges. Uh, you cannot be sure where the tiles are exactly located, even if you move the, the sample in a, in a very controlled way. You know? Uh, due to uh, physical imprecision of the motors and also some microscope uh, misalignment, you know? for instance, the camera tilt or, or the alignment of the light sheet. Uh, next question, how should you uh, blend uh, the intensity, so the, the tiles, uh, especially if you have non-uniform illumination or some local artifacts, so you have different ways to do it, this. Some are signal-based, others are deterministic, so giving some, some weights to the tiles. I will uh, cover this also, so the approach we take uh, in a further slide. Um, one uh, typical uh, misalignment uh, in microscopy is uh, camera tilt. So if the uh, system of translation of the uh, sample, the XY system in red here, is not fully aligned to uh, the camera field, the XY uh, uh, coordinate system of the camera chip, uh, in this case, uh, if you want to tile the images uh, properly, you have to uh, move the tiles. Uh, no rotation has actually to be involved. It's just a matter of uh, 2D translating the tiles to the, uh, the, the correct position. So it's, uh, it's quite simple to uh, correct for this. And assuming that you take uh, these tags, so several uh, slices, you can actually uh, uh, at least as a first first order uh, approximation, apply the, the same transformation to all the slices across the stack. No, and this is what we do in uh, Mosaic Explorer J. 
uh, correction of the tilt uh, of the light sheet. So we're just assuming that it's coming on one side. So if the uh, Z axis that you use to uh, uh, build the image stacks is not perfectly perpendicular to the light sheet. So in other words, if it's slightly tilted, um, uh, you might also have an issue when you uh, um, tile, uh, when you stitch, sorry, the, the tiles of the mosaic. And uh, a way, so this is represented graphically here, a way to uh, correct for this is to uh, actually shift, shift uh, the tiles. So in the Z dimension, uh, one respect to the other. Uh, so that you get a good match within a, a given slice you know, of the of the whole mosaic. Uh, it's also a simple operation because you uh, you can actually shift the whole tile by a fix uh, the offset. Uh, and in uh, Mosaic Explorer J, there is a simple way uh, so that the user can adjust these uh, shifts. Uh, actually, you don't have to adjust them for all the tiles, but only for uh, the first row and the first columns. Uh, first column, sorry, because the, um, the correction can be, uh, again, to a first order, proved to be uh, XY separable. So it's not uh, such a big uh, manual work to do this. Um, then uh, how do you find uh, the, the right position of the tile? So uh, David already covered this, but you essentially have two ways to do this. One is based on the uh, intensity signal and uh, uh, correlation between the images. So you, you can compute uh, the correlation in the overlap region between uh, two tiles, so in a pairwise way, uh, and then optimize this correlation uh, to find the, the right location. No? Uh, another method, and this is the, the approach we take, is to use a reference landmark. Uh, so these landmarks can be either automatically detected, uh, interest point, as David introduced, or uh, and picked, so you manually uh, reference uh, these landmarks, and then you use them to find the transformation between the landmarks, and you apply the same transformation to the tiles. Uh, so, since we use a constraint constraint model to uh, uh, move the tile one respect to the other, uh, we can actually uh, afford, so to say, uh, asking the user to mark these landmarks because with only few reference points, you can typically get to already a, a quite accurate reconstruction of the of the mosaic. Okay, uh, then how to blend uh, the intensity of the tile, so the signal of the tile, so you have, again, two categories, I would say. One is deterministic, uh, so for instance, you average in the overlap region or you use some progressive blending, so giving a, a ramp of weights that is increasing as you, you move in the overlap region and decreasing for the other image, okay? Or it can be signal dependent. So a simple signal dependent function is to use a, a maximum intensity function between the tiles, so only the maximum intensity shows up, for instance, or you can use some more advanced uh, weighting uh, uh, modes or functions such as using the local contrast or the local sharpness uh, while you merge. So I know that the big stitcher supports these uh, more advanced modes. We use uh, only these uh, simple modes that are shown here on the on this slide in, in Mosaic Explorer J. Um, so as I said, initially, we, we started to develop this macro to uh, work with a, a custom light sheet microscope we have in the lab. Uh, and then it was expanded because it was working quite well in our hands. So we wanted to, you know, to make it available to a larger audience. So um, uh, our microscope is uh, represented here. So it's a real picture of the, of the microscope. Uh, as you can see, it has two uh, detection sites, so uh, two objectives here, and the camera that you don't see here, and also two illumination sites. So the light sheet are formed with two cylindrical lens coming from both sides, and a system of pivot scan also for uh, both sides. Uh, and then uh, the sample, so uh, we use it for optically clear uh, sample, uh, quite large samples. It's uh, sitting in a quartz chamber, uh, that is completely independent of the system. So it can be uh, positioned on the microscope uh, here, you can see, uh, and we use uh, air lens to, uh, to image. So I won't enter in the specificity of this microscope because it's a bit uh, unrelated to the, to the macro itself since the, 
uh, optical correction is actually performed live while occurring the image uh, because you have some defocusing uh, when you move the chamber respect to the objective since there are uh, air lenses but I, I won't enter these details here uh, just to say that it's a, a, a system with dual side illumination and, and dual side uh, dual side detection uh, the workflow we use when we process a data set acquired with these images is essentially a four step in the software and i will uh, demo uh, some of them so uh, we first uh, stitch the four mosaics so from left right and also the two cameras uh, independently uh, for this we only use uh, 3d translations of the tiles so following the, the model i illustrated before uh, then we register the two cameras uh, so by uh, two by two, the mosaics here on the uh, on this uh, part of the slide, you can see uh, the process. So only for the left side, but you would have also two other mosaics for the right side if it's a dual side illumination. Uh, this registration of the uh, two mosaics from the two cameras after reconstruction of the uh, mosaic uh, is based on a 2D uh, similarity. Uh, transformation so we account for uh, rotation at this step uh, some scaling uh, that is useful especially if the two objectives don't have exactly the same magnification and of course uh, some translation uh, of the of the mosaic uh, our approach is quite simple so we perform this registration in a, a single z slice that we call the union slice okay and then uh, we only keep half of uh, uh, the stacks from the camera. So the best side is kept and the other side is discarded. And the registration is only performed at the union between the, these two half stacks. Uh, and of course, the same uh, transformation is applied to all the, the slices of the camera that is registered to the other one. Uh, then in the third step, uh, we align and blend the two sides. Uh, if we have two illumination sites. Uh, this is very simple. Again, we just use a tra 3D translation of uh, one mosaic respect to the other. So uh, you can prove that it only works well if your light sheet have the same orientation, so the same tilt, or at least if they are not tilted uh, along the horizontal axis of the image. In this case, you would really need a, a 3D uh, rotation to, to correct for this. So. It's a bit of a limitation uh, at the moment, so um, but um, still, for not too uh, large mosaics, or if this tilt is not too high, it, it already works quite well. Uh, finally, you can correct uh, illumination, so uh, by simply scaling the intensity of one side respect the other, and also applying, if you wish, uh, some um, uh, flat field correction. So you can provide some reference images for this correction, or also, uh, try to adjust uh, a simple model based on a, a linear correction so uh, of the of the intensity profile um, okay so uh, that's it for the intro i will now uh, move to the uh, demo uh, just to mention the code is available on github it's very simple to install it's just an image macro uh, there's also an article that is under review, uh, but you, you can, so it's an interactive review, you can already read it. Uh, and importantly, uh, there are uh, five video tutorials uh, that are covering the four steps I described before. Uh, so they essentially go into more detail into what I will show now in the, in the demo. Uh, for the demo, I will switch to another machine. Uh, I could run it on my laptop, but since some of the data sets are really big, like over one terabyte, I, I don't have them there. So I, I will connect to a, a remote machine we have in the facility. Okay, it's here. So um, the first uh, thing you want is to install the, the macro. Uh, so here I already installed it. Uh, you see Mosaic Explorer J here. Um, then, uh, the data set we will use here. Let me show you. The first one I want to open is uh, this one. So it's um, only one side in this case of a, a large uh, data set of over one terabyte. And as you can see, the tiles are uh, 3D. So we only have, uh, we have all the slices in each of the file and each file is about 20 gigabyte in that case. Okay, so I will, open this uh, data, data set to show you the 
Okay. The interface. And so the first dialog box told me that um, uh, there was already a, an alignment file in the same folder. So each time you align a mosaic and you exit the software, uh, this alignment file can be saved and automatically uh, loaded on the on the first uh, run. Uh, here we see the uh, mosaic in uh, color mode. So I will switch to uh, uh, grayscale mode. Okay, uh, so it's a, it's a regular image window. You can really use all the features of uh, image we only see the xy view so there is no way to interactively rotate in uh, in 3d in this case i mean that's always the the view you see um, if you want to navigate uh, through the sample so uh, you use uh, alt to open this uh, navigation menu that i call the, the control panel so here you can for instance uh, change the z slice you are uh, looking at uh, as you can see, the loading is quite fast. Um, and here we see, uh, so it's uh, 16 tiles on each side. Uh, we have left and right illumination side. So uh, it's already uh, quite uh, big. Um, here you have access to the different dimensions. So if you have uh, camera and double-sided, I, I will show you a bit more in the next demo. Here, it's about the alignment of the uh, tiles in X and Y, so essentially to correct for the camera tilt. Uh, this part here uh, is used to move the tiles in the Z dimension, so to correct for light sheet uh, tilt in this case. And here in this last part, we have the intensity correction and we can also change the blending mode of the tiles. Okay, So here I'm using, for instance, max intensity instead of uh, the um, additive mode that I had before. So uh, I will now open a slightly, uh, well, quite smaller uh, data set to show you uh, some of the interaction for alignments of um, a mosaic. So this is this one. So it's a single side, single camera. In this case, it's a, a simpler case, OK? So as you can see, we only have uh, three tiles from the uh, previous data set. I will zoom in a bit. Uh, so here, the tiles are just laid on uh, based on their file naming. So there is no uh, uh, overlap and alignment performed. And uh, the way to align the uh, uh, tiles is quite simple. You just have to draw, uh, to join some uh, matching features. So this, this would be your first landmark and the other landmark. You press Alt and you uh, tick this register. So we we estimated the x overlap uh, between the images, uh, and then you do the same uh, for the y overlap. So you have to be relatively accurate. You can actually zoom in a bit more, but uh, I'm just going fast here. But now I perform uh, the alignment of the of the tiles. Okay, as you can see, it should blend to uh, yellow. If you are in a good uh, position, you can also move uh, in uh, Z to check uh, whether it's also good in other uh, position. It seems fine. So once you're happy with your with the alignment, you would switch to uh, the grayscale mode, uh, find the right blending. So for instance, uh, max intensity blending. And now you are ready to uh, export uh, the images. Uh, you do it simply by going to export here. Uh, I won't export uh, all the slices, only a uh, few of them. Uh, okay. Let's export them here in this folder. Okay. The images have been exported. I can exit uh, the macro and open the exported images. The last folder that was used actually by image J, so that's why it was already here. Uh, I will adjust the intensity, zoom in. So now the image have been stitched and are just open in a, in a regular image stack uh, uh, viewer, okay? Uh, we could export as many as we wish and also uh, several channels. If we have different uh, channels in the in the stack, this is uh, just a, a one-click operation. Uh, I will go 
quickly on the last uh, demo. Uh, okay. So in this case, the channel names are a bit different. Okay. So it's a, it's a different uh, sample. In this case, we only have small one by three uh, mosaic, but it's a dual sided, so left and, and right side. And we also have two cameras in this case. So I, I want to show you how the uh, camera are aligned. Um, okay, so the first thing I will do is to uh, use again, grayscale and max intensity mode. And I will uh, zoom in a bit on uh, a feature here in this uh, in this part of the image. Uh, so uh, the wall stack has 1,200 slices. Uh, so the first thing I will do is to move uh, on one of the sides. So one one of the extreme plane. And so here you can see the first camera. Uh, on one, one side that is close to uh, the plane we are looking at. So if I change the camera, if I move to the, the other camera, as you can see, the quality is not as good because now we are seeing through the sample. So the, the light is scattered and the signal is degraded. If I move to the other uh, side, so now the quality is good on this camera and uh, slightly worse on the, on the other camera, as you can see now. So uh, the, whole, the whole ID is, I, I will go back to the uh, middle slice. Um, the whole ID is to uh, register the two cameras in the plane where you uh, want to make the switch between, between both cameras. Uh, and this is done with the same uh, process. So you just have to uh, point click landmarks uh, to, to, to find uh, the, the proper uh, transformation. And once the alignment is performed, you can check it here, uh, so here we have the position of the adjustment of the camera, so translation, rotation, and scaling. Uh, so again, if it uh, if it's properly aligned, you should see it uh, blend to uh, to yellow, uh, as we see here. And uh, once you've done this, um, you can also uh, export uh, the images. But in this case, so again, I will export only a few slices. But in this case, I'm telling the software that it should switch the camera. So in this case, at the middle uh, slice, which is slice 600, okay? So it will automatically switch the camera and of course apply the, uh, uh, the same operation to all the slices on the camera that is uh, registered. Okay, so I export it here. In this case, it's slightly slower because one of the two camera is registered. So uh, we have some 2D rotation and scaling. So it's uh, not as fast as before. Okay. Uh, and here I exported both channels. Uh, so yeah, now it's doing the uh, second channel that actually I haven't shown before, but it's a uh, auto fluorescent channel. Okay. So I will exit and open the images. Okay. So since I have two channels, I should first uh, split them and well not split in some hyperstack viewer and also the intensity. Okay. So if I'm moving uh, more or less where I was here, uh, as you can see, we see the camera switch, but it's quite smooth, no? So it's around here and here, okay? So we see uh, there is some blurring uh, on one side that is not exactly on the other one, but the images are, are quite nicely uh, registered. So with this, uh, I'm done. So just uh, the last slide. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge yes, people at the facility, uh, Julien and uh, Lydia also for the sample preparation. And 
all our collaborators. Uh, so actually we have many more than, than the one that are named here, but the sample we use for the, the article and also in this presentation are listed here. And also the article uh, is uh, published in uh, uh, F1000 Research. So uh, it's uh, one of, um, it's funded by COST, uh, Nubias Action. Uh, that's Sebastian. It. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. So I'll make a quick question for you, if it's possible to, um, you know, adjust the stitching, uploading a list of points, and these points can be derived from another image analysis, maybe using some uh, fiducial markers like gold nanoparticles or other sort of staining that you try to segment, identify, localize precisely and use that one to improve the stitching? So uh, to, to, to answer the, the question properly, um, would these points be landmarks that could be used by the software or are they the, the position of the ties, like initial position of the ties? Landmarks, I guess, no? Uh, was... Fiducial markers, like for yeah. example, you have another staining of which you are really sure. Mm -hmm. So um, at the moment, it's not something that you can do as just importing the files. I mean, if you can visually visually see them in the images, this fiducial, it would anyway be quite easy to uh, point click them uh, in the same way that I have shown. And that would be uh, reasonably easy to do, but no, there is no way to import uh, landmarks externally at the moment. Um, the landmarks that you select are anyway uh, very few because the uh, uh, model is very constrained. Okay, so it's just a 3D translation uh, of the of the tiles and also applying some uh, camera rotation, tilt compensation, and light sheet compensation. So, so uh, actually, in practice, with only like uh, two or three points, you're done and also three points for the camera registration, uh, which is a procedure I haven't described, but you, you need also to point click three points to find the right scaling and, uh, and rotation. Uh, okay. Okay, so, so, thank so, you. Yeah. So thanks again for your presentation. And now we switch to the next speaker is John Bagovic from Genelia Research uh, Campus, and he will speak about big work. Thank you. All right, thanks again for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, uh, thanks again. Um, my name is John Bogovic. I'm part of Stefan Selfeld's lab at Genelia and I'm the author and maintainer of Big Warp. Um, Big Warp is a tool for manual uh, landmark-based registration between large image data. And I'm gonna just jump straight into the demo. Um, Actually, before I describe Big Warp, because N5 came up a couple of times, I wanted to point out that um, we've recently released a plugin, an ImageJ plugin, that enables easier saving and reading of N5 datasets into ImageJ with some options for metadata. Um, we should also, it's important to point out that N5 is compatible with a lot of other large block-based file stores, such as HDF5, ZAR, and ZAR, for example. And this means that you can use the plugins that we wrote to write to ZAR files, write to HDF5 files, as well as reading from ZAR and HDF5 files. Um, if you have Fiji, these, you have these already. Um, you can import with file, import, and it's all the way at the bottom, unfortunately, N5. And this will open up a window that um, you can learn more about the details of on this GitHub page. The, again, this is github.com, Salfed Lab, N5-IJ. Um, and as well, you can save um, any data set using file save as export N5. It'll give you some options. Again, these are described um, on this page. So we hope that these plugins make things, um, make this format more accessible um, and um, a lot easier. These, because it's tied to ImageJ, this means that really writing huge data sets is still a bit challenging, but um, we're open to continuing work on this and um, please be in contact with us. Speaking of, um, Please join the image.sc forum if you've not already. This is a good place to ask me questions about Big Warp and N5 and anything else. Um, and as well, a lot of the information that I'm going to describe is on the um, Big Warp wiki page on the ImageJ wiki. Uh, 
Okay, now let's really hop into it. If you have Fiji, then you already have Big Warp. It's accessible through plugins, Big Data Viewer, Big Warp. Um, and I'm going to start by demoing um, the plugin using a sort of vanilla ImageJ um, Image Plus style, and then I'll show another demo that uses N5 at the end. So this dialog appears and it asks you which image will be moving, that is which image will be the one that is transformed and which image will be fixed. So here um, in this example, I'm going to be using some correlative electron light microscopy data. So we'll align this electron micrograph to this palm data set. Um, this sample data is available publicly. I think it'll go in the chat, hopefully. Um, so if you press OK, two windows will appear quickly, three windows actually. So one of these shows the moving image. Um, here's the electron micrograph. The other shows the light data that will be our target image. And then there's another panel that will show the landmarks that we click. So the main workflow in Big Warp is um, you click landmarks with um, pressing space get into, enters you into landmark mode and you can click landmarks like so. Control Z undoes things. I'm actually going to make these landmarks appear in a different color and much bigger. Let me show you what I did. I went to settings, Big Warp options. I'm gonna increase this to an absurd degree and change it to a brighter color so that hopefully you can see now larger, well, absurdly large landmarks. I went a little bit too crazy perhaps. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by um, in between describing how the tool works, I'm gonna be just giving some tips on um, good landmark placement at the tool. So I'm going to be targeting these mitochondria and CEM data set. And so I see this C-shaped mitochondria in here. And so I'm going to find this thinnest part, for example, click on that thinnest part in the, in the moving image and then the target image. And you see that it kind of became highlighted once, um, once the pairing happened. See how this landmark is brighter than this one, for example. Okay, also important is um, to localize well in 3D when your images are 3D. So here I'm going to rotate the image when this is what makes big data viewer so powerful. It is enables us to really make sure that we've localized well in 3D. And because my landmarks are huge, it's a little tough to see, but um, I'll leave it at that. I'm going to place a few more landmarks um, in a couple of more places. So again, I'm finding other mitochondria. I'm going to place a landmark again in the moving image and then in the target. And also notice that I'm not placing too many landmarks close to each other. Um, it's generally wise to spread them out so that um, so this the transform can extrapolate well. Um, so I'll place one here. And then one more after this, I know exactly where I'm going since I planned these landmarks ahead of time. Very good. Um, I'm also skipping some of the details of how um, Big Warp's navigation happens because I'm pretty sure that this has been shown elsewhere in the webinar. Okay, so I'm gonna place this final one. I'll also notice, let's also notice that all of these landmarks appeared in the table and um, double clicking on them will zoom the window to those respective landmarks, which is pretty convenient if one gets lost, for example. Okay. And now the other most important hotkey of Big Warp is the T hotkey. So pressing T now warps the moving image. Um, and if in this window I press F, that fuses the image, that is that it displays the images on top of each other. So it looks okay. However, what I'm gonna do is rotate this and indeed we see that the alignment is pretty bad in the Z direction. And that's because all of four points that I've clicked so far are very nearly in a single plane, which means that while I localized well in this plane, I didn't localize well in the through plane. So I'm gonna undo the transformation by pressing T again, and I'm gonna place one more landmark in a different plane so um, you'll see all of my landmarks were in approximately this plane. 
approximately here. And so I'm gonna place one more over here. Let's find a nice mitochondrion. So let's undo this. And if I place one more, we'll see now that if I transform it, it's a lot better in Z as well. So another nice hotkey is Q, which aligns the other big warp window to the current window. So here, if I, for example, drag plus Q, drag plus press Q, drag press Q, you see that the other window moves along with this one. And if I rotate, you see that the absurd um, skewing that we saw in Z before is not there anymore because we have placed another landmark in a different plane. Okay. Um, that's the general workflow. Um, by default, Big Warp uses a thin plate spline transform, which is a nonlinear transform. You can see that it can really warp the image uh, a lot, um, which is good if one is willing to devote the time and care to placing landmarks carefully. Um, but occasionally, one doesn't need to um, place many landmarks if the transformation is simple. So choosing a, a simpler that is an affine similarity rotation or translation transform can work well. It might be wise to use those options. So we'll stick with the thin plate spline option for now. And um, I'm gonna show you a couple of more things before we move on to N5. The first is of course, it's very important to save your work. And what one saves is the landmarks. So um, control S is the hotkey that lets you save landmarks, or you can go from the landmark window, file, export landmarks, and, and save them as a readable CSV straightforwardly. The other useful thing is to export the warped image. And for that, the hotkey is control E, which brings up this dialogue, um, and I'll explain it briefly. Um, the default option, so if you, it's possible to just press OK and something reasonable will happen. And actually, I'll do that first. And the reasonable, the reasonable thing that it does, that is the default behavior, oops, is it transforms and re-renders the moving image so it, that it is at the same resolution and the same size as the target image. So we'll just have to wait a minute um, for that to work. Um, these are medium size, medium sized images. And here, here we go. So first observe that one, this is the warped EM image. It is the same size as the moving image. Um, and it's at the same resolution. So I'll show you that this is at about 100 by 100 by 200 nanometer. This should be nanometer resolution um, as this one is. Okay, I'll show one other option here. Um, suppose one wanted to render the result at a lower resolution. You can change this resolution option instead of being target to specified. So here target means render the result at the resolution of the target image. If we wanted it to be at, let's say half the resolution of the target image, we might say 200, 2000, 200 by 200 by 400 nanometer resolution, for example. And if we press OK, it should take much less time for the result to appear. And indeed it does. Here we are. Um, we see that the result looks approximately the same, but that the image is about half of the size of the target image. All right, very good. Um, let's see. OK. Um, another nice option is that when one clicks very many landmark points, applying the transformation can be, become slow. Um, so we, we have an option for exporting the transformation as a deformation or displacement field. Um, and that is possible by going to the file export warp field option. Um, and you can generally just press okay here. Um, and what it will produce is an image where the position at uh, where the pixel value at a given point describes the displacement that the transformation describes. Um, there, 
we have some tools for for using the output of this, um, but that's all I'll say for it for now, except as well that these uh, deformation fields can also be stored as N5, which are convenient if, for example, one wants to transform points instead of images, um, then one does not have to load the entire displacement field. So again, this is a three channel image and each component describes the displacement in physical units for the transformation. Okay, so um, I'm gonna stop this part of the demo for now. Um, and since so far I've only used small images, that is images that can fit on this old um, and small laptop, I wanna show that it's possible to also use very large image data. And in fact, I'm gonna use the same Im image data as I just showed but I'm going to use um, N5 images that are stored on Amazon AWS and that have been shared as part of Genelia's Open Organelle project. So this is openorganelle.genelia.org. And these data are, can be found on this page here under the CO7 cell over expressing ER and mitochondria markers for CLEM. If you click this, um, you can explore the data um, in Neuroglancer, or if you press this button, you will get a URL, which I think will be shared in the chat as well. Um, but these data can be used in Big Warp as well, and that's what I'll show now. Um, the, um, so the, the regular Big Warp plugin that I showed, this plugin's Big Data Viewer Big Warp, only, open, only works for images that are open in ImageJ. Um, there is also a Big Warp XML HDF5 option, which Christian Tischer kindly provided. Um, but for more general N5 image data sets, we have uh, scripts that are on the Big Warp repository. So these, if you go to the Big Warp GitHub page inside of scripts, what I'm gonna be showing is using the Big Warp N5 script, um, which I have open here. And um, I will actually pause by saying I've locally saved one of the light image data sets to an N5 container on this computer. So I'm going to be using two N5 data sets, one of which is stored um, on Amazon AWS and the other is stored locally on my laptop. So um, I also pre-clicked a few landmarks here, but um, if I press okay here, um, it'll take a second since it's contacting the server, finding the metadata, reading some things, reading the files that are locally on my machine, um, loading some patch, lo loading some blocks, getting ready to display things, and now it does. And because um, these images are not local, it didn't do anything smart with regards to brightness and color, but I can just very quickly adjust and show you that Indeed, there he, these are image data. This is the same image data set oriented a little bit differently. And now all of this image data is being fetched from Amazon and streamed into my little laptop. And this, is, um, this isn't quite a terabyte data set, but this is quite large. This is a many hundreds of gigabytes data set. And again, in this window, we have the light data set that we saw from before. And again, notice that here the moving image is the EM data set, which is enormous. I'm gonna just transform it just like I did before, press F just like I did before. And there we have it. I've just transformed on the fly um, a giant data set that I'm streaming from AWS. So here we are. It's a little bit messy since I wasn't especially careful with how I clicked, but I'll John, sorry to make a question about the uh, moving image and the target. Yes, please. We have, we have a question um, about why you use the M picture as the moving one. Why yes, is yes. We try to do the contrary. Indeed. Um, our collaborators tell us that um, because of the preparation that happens during EM, that it's likely that the morphology of the cell was more. Uh, is more deformed 
after the EM preparation than it was before that uh, EM preparation happened. That is, our collaborators think that the morphology of the light is closer to the truth than um, the EM. And that's why, in this case, we chose to warp the EM to the light. Of course, it's possible to do the reverse. Um, and it's easier to do the reverse since the light data are smaller. And part of what makes um, Big Warp useful, I think, is that it is not really harder in or it is not really harder, that is. Um, I hope that you appreciate that I warping this giant image is as easy as warping the small image. Um, so that um, big data viewer, big warp image lib two enable this um, one to have to care less about these kind of big data problems. I hope that answers your question. So there's- Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to just warp this on the fly a little bit if I can see the landmark and just show you that I can really uh, actually deform this giant data set more or less on the fly. And you see that it's slower than it was before because the data are bigger, um, but it's readily possible. And there's, okay, there's also a question, part of that question was having to do with the, um, the button that offers the choice of transformation being broken. Yes, that should be fixed though um, it's now moved to F2. So if you update your Fiji, um, now F2 will open this, this window instead of F8. Sorry about that. Um, and do report these things on the image.sc forum. Um, there was some discussion about it there. Okay. And I don't know how I am with time, but that is everything that I wanted to show. And so um, the other things that I could have shown, which I encourage people to try, um, are there are other capabilities that I didn't talk about, such as transforming ROIs. So image J ROIs can be transformed either from moving space to target space or vice versa, um, using another one of the scripts that we provide. As well, just arbitrary point coordinates can be pretty easily transformed using also scripts that we provide. And this information is all on the ImageJ wiki. Um, and I think I will leave it at that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so um, it was short, but there was all the information we needed, and we encourage Hope participants to so. make other questions. Okay, so now just a curiosity on my side, you talked about the N5 um, file format. Um, what do you think about it in terms of, um, you know, supporting it over time? If you think it's a file format, everybody should adopt because it allows, um, I saw it in one of your answer, it allows to, to do parallel computing in a better way compared to HDF5. If you can comment more about this. Yes, thanks, that's a great question. Um, we intend, we use N5 all of the time. So we, we intend to support it since it's what we use. Um, we, rather than think of it as its own file format, we try to, um, we try to think of it as just a smart way to access blocks of data in a general way. And again, what I mean by that is N5, the N5 file format is what, um, what I'm showing here, which is there are blocks in a folder on your file system generally. So here is a data set. This is the light data set that I stored as N5. And there are a bunch of folders in here. It goes a few deep. And then there's a small file in here that contains one block of image data. So this is what, this is what I call the N5 file format. HDF5 is a lot like this, but you can imagine that all of these folders and blocks are stored in a single file. And so this is part of what makes 
it's relatively easy for N5 plugins to read HDF5 files since they're essentially the same thing, but the storage mechanism is slightly different. Um, ZAR is popular in the Python world, um, but it is again, very similar in spirit. And so while we intend to continue supporting N5 because we use it a lot, um, we also intend to continue supporting, uh, we, we want our software to play well and interact nicely with other software that was meant to use ZAR or HDF5. Um, so while N5 will stick around, um, we also intend to share and work with other people who are doing um, file format like work. If you go on the image.se forum, there's a next gen file formats tag that you should check out and others like Josh Moore and Christian Tischers and many others are having discussions there about this stuff. Um, moving to why um, the parallelism. So HDF5, because it's a single file, writing many blocks at the same time to HDF5 is difficult slash impossible, and which was part of the reason we moved to the N5 specification where blocks are in different files. So the, the idea is that writing many files in parallel is possible and easy, whereas writing many blocks to an HDF5 container is not easy and slow. Um, so that was um, that's fleshing out a little bit more of what I said in the answer. Um, I hope that's clear. Um, I will say one more thing, which is a downside of having <clears throat> many files is that um, if one wanted to move, if one had a very huge N5 container, moving these files is slower than moving a single large file that it, that stores the same amount of data. So the plus side of, of the N5 format is writing things is much faster. Moving an entire container can be slower. Um, so other, I think I'll leave it at that, but I will yes. also just say that <laughs> there's, yes, okay. there's a lot of cloud, uh, cloud support as well. Okay. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I uh, thank again all the speakers and the panelists that in background they have done really nice work. And uh, thank you, the attendees, for being with us.